Hello. Hi. Hi, Pavin. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a long time, Florian. Yes, that's right. Hoshin. <laughs> yes, quite hey, a bit. And it, it feels even longer in this circumstance now. <laughs> Back from your vacation. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was Excellent. urgently needed. And now we have actually a, have a blog course this week. So I had 10 hours of Zoom already. So you I went to the forest or the mountains? Or where did you go? the forest or the mountains to get away? Yes, uh, we actually went um, to a rock area, of course. You could understand. Hotel, so. <laughs> I, uh, That's I, a here. I recently rewatched um, that movie about uh, uh, Yosemite. Uh, what's the guy's name? Ah, um, the, yes. Uh, Free Solo. Free Solo, yeah. Again, I was sitting on the edge of my seat every time I watch it. <laughs> yes, it's a bit it's intense. And the good news is he's still alive. So, so I, yes, that's it. No, he's very, very careful. So I have, um, it's, it's evening here in, in Germany, so I probably have to have a beer at the same time, but I brought the appropriate class. So, sorry, even not to, <laughs> not to big pain on you, but. <laughs> Wait, Florian, I have something for you. Uh, ah, fantastic. That's Aachen, <laughs> right? <laughs> of course, Cologne, great. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Leila, do you, uh, can you allow me uh, permission to share? Yeah, so you are the co-host now. Okay, all right. Maybe do that for me already too. That's and Stephen also. Then we oh, don't have right. to arrange that later. Of course. Just want to say thanks again, Leela, for doing this. It's such a great service. Um, Thank you for joining us. This has been a great group. So welcome you. everyone. I just thank them for suggesting it because uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. It's a collaborative effort. So thank you everyone for being here. And let's get started with the discussion today. Today we are going to be discussing uh, the paper, the information barrel net uh, method by Tishby, Pereira, and Bialek. So, Hoshin, okay. the floor is yours. Can you guys see slides? Okay. We can see your desktop and now your slides. Perfect. Okay. Um, I got a little carried away. There's about 36 slides here, but uh, um, I tried to be comprehensive and also add some commentary as we're going along. Um, and I want to make sure that Stephen also has a chance to speak. So I'll either try to go through it quickly or we can you know, skip some and uh, well, I'll post the slides uh, later on the, on the website so people can access them. So today we're talking about information bottleneck concept. Um, it goes back to about 20 years to Tishbi uh, from Israel and his uh, co-workers. And as I said, this is not just a summary, it's sort of also an interpretation because I found it so interesting. So um, we start with a prediction mapping problem. We want to use the information in some variables x to predict or estimate y. I've shown you here what the joint distribution of px and y might look like. And so arguably, this is the problem of estimating p of x comma y, from which you infer p of y given x. So this involves extracting and using information y that's relevant. And that's the key word when we're going through this prediction 
bottleneck, uh, sorry, the information bottleneck concept is that that is relevant for prediction of Y. So that means there may be information X that is not relevant, and that's the recognition. So the amount of information X about Y is quantified by mutual information. So um, understanding X means more than just predicting Y, it also requires choosing the features of X, and understanding which aspects of X play a role in the prediction. And this problem can be formalized as finding a short code for X. So X is your data, input data. Okay. Still hear me? Okay. Yes. Back now. So this problem is stated as that of finding a code for X, meaning a compression of X, a representation of X that preserves the maximum information about y. So x tilde is the features in x. In other words, why they call it a bottleneck is because you squeeze the information that x provides about y through this thing called a bottleneck formed by a limited set of code words x tilde so that the cardinality of x tilde is less than the cardinality of x. So this brings us to compression, uh, which Stephen has talked a lot about. Let x tilde be a compressed representation, a code or a model of x. You can use those words interchangeably. In other words, x tilde is described by a smaller number of bits than x. And you can have lossless compression if there's no loss of information, meaning that you can recover x from x tilde without loss of fidelity. Uh, in which case, the mutual information between x and x tilde is just equal to the entropy of x. There's no loss of information. If it's a lossy compression of x, there is some loss of information, and therefore you can't completely recover x perfectly from x tilde without loss of fidelity. In this case, i of x, x tilde is less than h of x. And this is the problem that Shannon was working on uh, when he was doing his communication theory stuff. Uh, this is not in the paper, but it's worth recognizing that the compressed representation x tilde of x is not unique, which means you can have multiple compressed representations, uh, all of which have the same mutual information with x. And this is true because any representation can be transformed into an informationally equivalent representation by some kind of invertible nonlinear transformations and rotations. Um, and then why relevance comes into this is because only some of these representations may have relevance or meaning to us in the sense that they are interpretable. Okay, so that's a different sense of the meaning relevance than the one just saying the parts of X that are relevant to Y. Okay, this is relevance in the sense of meaning as opposed to relevance in the sense of predictive uh, capability. Uh, they also use the term minimal sufficient statistics, actually in some earlier papers, where they're basically pointing out that compression can be viewed as achieving a representation in terms of its minimal sufficient statistics. And um, what that means is that they are, uh, uh, they are the smallest number of things that you need in order to characterize. So for example, for a Gaussian distribution, the minimal sufficient statistics are the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, uh, but of course these are also not unique in terms of representation. You can have multiple combinations of mean and standard deviation, which convey the same amount of information about the Gaussian distribution. But these two have particular relevance and meaning to us. Um, and then they point out that other than common exponential forms, uh, uh, Gaussian distributions, exponential, double exponential, gamma, log normal, all exponential forms of distributions, those distributions have a finite number of parameters. So in general, other than common exponential forms, you don't have a fixed, uh, well-defined number of min minimal sufficient statistics. So in this case, in the general case where you have a data set which comes from some arbitrary distribution, you can think of in terms of approximate minimal sufficient statistics, the number that are sufficient, more or less, to do the job. And so uh, coming back to Stephen's point of view, AIT, we can therefore think of X tilde as being related to some kind of minimal description length representation. 
Um, in lossy compression, there's going to be inevitable loss of information, reduced fidelity. And by choosing your representation x tilde, you determine which information is preserved and which is lost. So you choose different representations. You can control what information you preserve and what information you lose. And so what they do is they define what they call a relevant summary, a particular compression or compression, a particular compression x tilde is relevant in the sense that it captures only the relevant or meaning of inf information in x, which is needed to predict or estimate y, and ignores the parts of x that are not needed uh, to, to predict or estimate y. And so you can think of going directly from x to y or going from x to y through some relevant compressed representation. Um, in terms of machine learning or in terms of science, we can think of x tilde as being the features of x that are relevant to the prediction of y. So if you've got an image, a remote sensing image of cloud maps, um, the Persian uh, system that Sarush's group developed um, extracts features from those images, cloud properties and so on and so forth, roughness and size and shape and so on which are considered to be relevant to the prediction of x. But in that case, they were doing those that feature extraction in the initial, initial case in a way that was defined by people thinking about it, as opposed to automatically through some kind of machine learning. And in machine learning, this is, of course, the fundamental problem of feature selection and pattern recognition. These are sometimes other terms used in literature, relevant quantization, because you're quantizing your data set down to a a smaller number of uh, uh, discrete variables, or a quantized codebook. These are terms that are used interchangeably. So we can think of an optimal x tilde as a minimal as the minimal sufficient statistics of the joint distribution p x of y that relate to the input uh, that relate the inputs to the outputs the x to y. Um, alternatively, from the conditional distribution y to an x. In other words, uh, they're the statistics of the conditional distribution y, uh, p of y given x. The interesting example they give in their paper is one of acoustic signals. So um, you might have a waveform, which is a wave file or MP4 file, or MP3 file, or something like that, where you're basically preserving the waveform, a complete acoustic waveform, and some if you do any compression beyond the entropy of speech, you may not be able to reconstruct this entire waveform perfectly. Okay. On the other hand, somebody could listen to that waveform and prepare a written transcript. And this written transcript will have a much, much lower entropy by many orders of magnitude than the acoustic waveform. So that written transcript has somehow captured the meaning of all these sounds and stored them in a much lower compressed uh, representation. And uh, that means it's possible to compress much further than uh, what is needed, than the entropy of speech, um, in order to extract the, in, the relevant information from that waveform. In other words, preserve information about words and their meaning. In this case, the additional variable that determines what's relevant might be the transcription of the signal. So the idea now is we want to compress the original waveform. We want to do it in a way that preserves the relevant information we want to pre uh, preserve, uh, uh, to, to, yeah, that, that keeps the relevant information we want to preserve. And we're going to use the transcript as the relevance variable y to determine what's preserved. Relating this to earth sciences, we can think of a, a very high re resolution representation where we've got in 3D space-time a complete representation of system inputs, variables, processes, parameters, material and geometric properties. And we could ask, and we could say the relevance variable is just the stream flow hydrograph at the outlet of this catchment represented by the system on the left. And in this case, we might find, as has been typically done in science, in hydrologic science, that you can come up with a much lower resolution or compressed representation as a conceptual rainfall runoff model or something like that, 
which is able to, to uh, preserve only the relevant information from the left that is necessary in to, to predict the stuff in the Y, so a highly reduced order model. So I, in my mind, this is one way of thinking of this uh, problem. Arguably, of course, the goal of science is lossless compression. In other words, we want a non-lossy model, which means that I of Y X tilde, the mutual information between X tilde and Y is exactly the same as the mutual information between X and Y. But of course, we have incomplete data, imperfect understanding, and so on. So our compressions are usually lossy, uh, maybe in what I call overcompressions. And so as a result, Y tilde does not match Y. And this is evidenced by the fact that I of Y X tilde is, um, is uh, usually much less than I of Y, y X. And this was shown um, some time ago by Wei Gong for conceptual rainfall runoff modeling. And uh, Gray also did some work showing this. In other, in other words, the I of Y of Y tilde, so if we take Y, which is the, the observations, we take Y tilde, which is the model prediction, and we measure the mutual information, that's much less than the total amount of information we're trying to explain. So um, you can also think in terms of reduced order modeling, where sometimes our goal is not lossless compression, but instead to construct a reduced order model that predicts only some relevant aspect Y star of Y, okay, only certain aspects of Y that we care about predicting. And then we have what we call a reduced order model. And in general, this is going to happen anytime we need a sufficiently good but parsimonious representation that just provides only the information we need to make decisions. And Stephen might have something to say about that later. So we're going from the full order space to a reduced order space. And as an example over here, we go from a full representation of a bunny to a reduced order representation of the bunny, but you can still say it's a bunny. And an extreme example might be that we take the entire hydrologic cycle and we reduce it to this visual conceptual diagram. So that's a modeling process, right, which is an extreme representation down to just the small amounts of things that we think we need in order to convey the ideas of the hydrologic cycle to students or to ourselves. So uh, the information bottleneck uh, basically means we squeeze information about the relevant quantity y that x provides about y through the bottleneck formed by X tilde. And we want our quantization or our compression uh, to also be relevant by capturing as much information about Y star as possible. Of course, Y star must not be independent from X. They have to have mutual, positive mutual information, otherwise you can't predict one from the other. But I of X tilde Y star will be less than or equal to I of X Y star, since lossy compression can't convey more information than the original data. And so we're seeking an assignment for X tilde that compresses X uh, while preserving a fixed amount of meaningful information about Y. Mathematically, Tishby et al. think about this in this way, that X be the signal space with a fixed probability measure P of X. And we have X tilde, which is a compressed representation. Then we want to seek a mapping P of X tilde to X, the probability of X tilde given X, which partitions X into blocks, where each block is associated with one of the elements X tilde, with some probability measure defined as that. And the quality of this representation, which is what Shannon was studying, is called the information rate, how much information is preserved. Of course, you can have different kinds of clustering. You can have soft clustering, where X is mapped onto X tilde in a fuzzy way using probability distributions. Or you can have a hard clustering where each element of X is mapped on to a specific element of X tilde. Uh, the quality of this in representation is determined by what Shannon calls the information rate. And that's quantified as the average number of bits per message need to specify an element without confusion. And this is bounded below by the mutual information. And so you end up with a with a trade-off between compression, how much, what's the signal representation size, which is called the information rate, and the expected distortion or the loss of information of, in the reconstructed signal. 
And this rate distortion function looks like this. They call it RD in the paper. And on the y on D, you've got the uh, amount of distortion increasing to the right. On the y-axis, you've got the rate increasing uh, uh, towards the top. And so you can see, you can have the full rate, preserve the full rate with no distortion. And you can have a moderate rate, with low distortion, or a very low rate of information transfer with high, high distortion. And Shannon was interested in uh, you want to limit the amount of distortion and calculate how much, what the rate should be, how much compression you should do. So for good representations, distortion is small and the trade-off is monotonic. So they do that to find the rate distortion function. They basically construct this functional, which is you're minimizing f with respect to this mapping p of x tilde given x. So you're trying to find the mapping p of x tilde given x um, by taking the i of x x tilde, which you're trying to reduce. You're trying to find the most compressed representation. And uh, by defining a distortion function, which says how much distortion we're willing to accept. So that's a constraint on the problem. We form the Lagrangian. You have the Lagrangian parameter b. And so we're minimizing mutual information between the original uh, data and its compression while constraining the amount of distortion and, um, uh, and we determine how much uh, that trade-off is by specifying this Lagrange multiplier. It turns out that you can solve this um, uh, using calculus and you get a form which looks like this where p x tilde x which is the, the compression determines uh, sorry, is 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 related to an initial a, is is related to the compressed uh, distribution um, times an exponential, which depends on the distortion rate. And uh, of course, it's normalized in order to make this probability distortion. When beta is equal to zero, e raised to zero is um, one, and so p x tilde x is just p of x tilde. And you and as beta increases, you put a stronger and stronger constraint on distortion. Um, and you can and then it turns out you can solve this problem by following what's called the BA algorithm, which is you guess p of x tilde, you use this equation to calculate p x tilde given x. Uh, you uh, um, you then uh, integrate out x. To get x tilde back, you put it back in there and you cycle it around and around. And there's a lemma by these guys that assures that this converges globally. And so uh, the algorithm looks like this. We select beta. We start with any initial um, prior guess on p of x tilde given x. We calculate p x tilde. We stick it in here. We go through these steps and we just go round and round until it converges. Um, they claim that the iterations converge to a unique minimum of f in the convex sets of the two distributions. And you can see that this is very similar to expectation maximization. You solve part of the problem, and then you use it to determine the other part of the problem, and then you just cycle around. Uh, in general, of course, it does not have a unique solution, uh, because while you have a unique solution in each direction, the combined thing might not have a unique solution. Uh, some limitations of this theory are that you have to specify the distortion function. And when you specify the distortion function, which says how much distortion you're willing to accept, this implicitly determines which features of x are relevant and which are not relevant. And those features are often not explicitly known. So arbitrary choice of the distortion function corresponds to arriving at arbitrary features. And uh, so the algorithm deals only with how we partition x to x tilde, but not with choosing some optimal choice of x tilde. Okay. So information rate alone is not enough to characterize good quantization, because you can always reduce the rate by just throwing away details of x. You want to preserve relevant information. So there's where we come to information bottleneck, where we uh, 
of course, they say they assume access to joint distribution here. Basically, instead of the distortion, what they do is they replace the distortion function by this function, the mutual information between x tilde and y. In other words, you're trying to maximize or minimize the loss of information in x tilde about y, and that y is the relevance variable. So we're still minimizing mutual information i of x x tilde, but now we're constraining it based on the amount of mutual information we want to preserve to get relevant uh, uh, representation, and we have the same Lagrange multiplier. And again, there's a trade-off between compressing and insert distortion, and the trade-off is with preserving meaningful information. And you get the same form of exponential. You'll see that this looks exactly the same as before, except that now the distortion function um, But now the distortion function turns out to be the Kullback divergent between y of x, p of y given x and p of y given x tilde, which sort of makes sense. Okay. You're trying to minimize the loss of information about y, x, y given x with the approximation y of x given x tilde. And they don't, they don't uh, assume the DKL divergence. It just emerges from the mathematics of trying to solve this problem. So when beta is equal to zero, quantization is very poor, and everything is assigned to a single point. And as we make beta go towards infinity, we go towards more and more detailed quantizations until we preserve all of the all of x. And they say with in for interesting special cases, it, it's possible to preserve almost all of the meaningful information. Uh, while still having a, a, a significant amount of compression. So uh, it turns out that it's natural to consider kullback liebler divergence as the distortion measure. And the algorithm then looks exactly the same as the BA algorithm, except that you now have another step. The first two equations are the same, uh, except that the D is replaced by the kullback liebler divergence. And the third equation over there involves calculating p of y given x tilde, and then iterating around and around. So once again, uh, convergence does not imply uniqueness because the functional is convex in each, in, in, in each distribution independently, but are not in the product space. Uh, you still have to specify the structure and cardinality of x, so it doesn't solve and tell you what x tilde should be. Uh, but it, but it, but it constrains x tilde to be the, the, the kinds of x tilde that are relevant. And so for every choice of the cardinality of x tilde, how much information we preserve, we end up with corresponding values for these things. And by progressively changing p, b, we move across convex planes in the IP plane, which is illustrated in this diagram over here, where you're moving, um, in this case, z is the, uh, z is x tilde, z is the compression. Uh, different papers use different terminology. And so uh, along the x-axis is compression, and along the y-axis is information preservation. And so you can see that you can get almost max, you can get ma at the point with the little arrow there, you can get maximal information, uh, almost maximal information preservation with almost 50% compression. They also find that um, whenever you specify a particular value of beta, that you get these bifurcations. So your curves move along different paths depending on the value which you choose for beta. So you get these bifurcations where you don't, you, you can't max, in other words, you, you can't preserve all of the information, but you, have, you move off this generic curve onto another curve. So at that in the at the end of the paper they say future work uh, the in bottleneck principle provides a framework for different information processing problems including prediction filtering learning they reference a paper which I can't find so apparently the paper never got published saying we show examples of this somewhere else um, they they uh, refer many papers where they say it's been successfully applied to many real world problems including semantic clustering in English words etc. 
Um, but if you just search information bottleneck on, on the internet, you'll find a number of commentaries. So there's this website, which uh, Daniel uh, sent me, which says uh, the information bottleneck uncovering, the, does it uncover the secret of deep learning? And there's a lot of controversy. And the controversy arose when they attempt to apply this information bottleneck principle to deep learning and claimed that it may give some insights into why deep learning proceeds the way it does and how, why it's successful. So they published this paper, they, they, they submitted this paper to Arvix. They published this paper on Arvix in 2015, and it still remains on Arvix. It has not been accepted by any journal. Um, because uh, uh, it uh, ended up creating a lot of controversy. And I'm just going to very briefly mention that controversy. Um, here's some other commentaries. Why is the information bottleneck as in, an important theory of deep learning? Um, so they used it to study deep learning. So here's your deep learning uh, system. You've got X, your input layer. You've got your Ts are going to represent the hidden layers. These are the compressions. And Y is your output. And they propose that they, they can uh, study the trade-off between compression between the input and any hidden layer, right? the information contained in that hidden layer, uh, and how much information that hidden layer preserves about the relevance variable which we're trying to predict. And they conjectured that training of a DNN consists of two separate phases, an initial fitting phase in which the mutual information between the hidden layer representation and the target increases. You get better and better at predicting the, the target. And then a subsequent layer compression phase in which the mutual information between the inputs and the, and the hidden layers decreases. And they published uh, figures that look like this. So you've got compression along the um, uh, x-axis the mutual information along the x-axis. Uh, so compression is to the left and lack of compression is towards the right. Information preservation is towards the right. And you've got your mutual information between the hidden layer and the target on the y-axis. And you can see if you take uh, one of these curves that you start uh, down here and you improve your representation so that you increase the amount of information about x that's preserved by the hidden layer t. So you keep increasing the amount of information that's represented by the hidden layer. At the same time, you're increasing the amount of information that the hidden layer uh, has is contains about the target. And so it goes up. And then they show that what happens at some point is it starts to compress. So you're improving the performance of the network but they claim that you're now starting to compress, uh, uh, generate a compressed representation. Jim, short question. As we move along a black line, is it epochs of learning? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then each of these uh, lines here represents a different layer. So this is done for a very simple, uh, deep network with only three or four or five or six layers. I don't remember exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a toy problem that they constructed, okay? So they published this, and uh, they put that on Arvix, and these guys, Sachs et al. in 2018, came by and said that they couldn't reproduce this result when they tested this on more complex problems. Uh, in particular, they claimed that if you used RELU, uh, Rectified Linear Unit Activation Functions, uh, because the original, I think, used uh, sigmoidal functions, uh, that this doesn't, didn't happen. Um, then in 2018, another group, Nashad et al. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so, sorry, Schwartz and, uh, uh, Schwartz and Tishby then said, actually, this was not a valid paper. It was not a valid result because they, they did not use a method that was very good at estimating mutual information. They claimed that the, the weakness was in the method used to estimate mutual information in high-dimensional spaces. It wasn't a, a criticism of the information bottleneck, but it was due to use of imp improper tools for measuring mutual information. So Noshad et al. Uh, developed a much more 
accurate method for estimating mutual information is based on something called hash functions, which I have difficulty understanding. Um, and they went in and studied uh, some neural networks where the layers are 784, 200, 160, 30, 10, decreasing sizes of layers uh, using the MNIST number data set with RELU activation functions, and they published this graph, which in fact showed compression. But then a couple of papers published that should say 2019 and 2020 argued that this compression that is observed is not actually a true compression, but it's again caused by the way in which information theory metrics are constructed and computed. And it has to do with the geometric phenomenon, which is the fact that you have to use bin, fixed bin sizes. And if you don't choose your bin sizes appropriately, uh, you get distortion in the computation of mutual information. And um, it's a very, very interesting paper. There's a whole section in there about how to do, how you can severely compromise your results by uh, not having a good, a good estimator of mutual information when you're trying to do this kind of work. So uh, just to summarize, um, uh, this as uh, sciences as something like this, where we've got a very, very complex system. We might have a lot of information in principle available to us. We're trying to predict something simple like a stream flow hydrograph, simple in quotes, and we're looking for a lower resolution compressor representation. Um, the relevant information by, provided by precipitation and evapotranspiration uh, gets encoded, in our case, as a number of stores, soil moisture stores in the soil, which we need to track the values off in order to predict runoff, right? And uh, conceptual rainfall runoff modeling suggests that you need only three or four or five or six or something like that in order to, to do daily stream flow forecasting. And in fact, you might only need only one or two to do monthly uh, forecasting on some scale. Um, I wanted to point out uh, in conclusion uh, that it becomes apparent from this literature that there are considerable difficulties in computing the information metrics. And I've sort of alluded to this when we met at our uh, meetings in Europe, where I was pointing out that we need to come up with some accurate and um, well uh, agreed upon uh, methods of calculating these metrics, because otherwise different people will use different methods for computing the metrics and you won't be able to compare information across different studies. Okay, And that's pointed out in the paper by Goldfeld. And that's due to these quantization effects. And I'm trying to work myself on a method which might uh, allow us to do this without doing binning, without doing that binning kind of quantization. Um, there is some extensions to this work. There's something called a deterministic information bottleneck, where the mutual information in X and X tilde term is replaced instead by just the compressed size of X tilde. And then there's something called the information bottleneck with side information, which is another paper pointed published by the same authors, where they're saying, let's find the best compression X tilde, which preserves information about something I care about, while also distinguishing it from something else that I don't care about. Okay, so preserving information about Y1 while excluding information about another variable Y2. And this sounds to me a lot like some of the stuff that Praveen and his students have been interested in. So that's my, sorry, slightly long summary of the stuff that I got so excited and carried away that I read a lot of papers. So I'll turn it over to Stephen at this point. Um, yeah, so um, I had a, a couple of questions when I read the paper um, that I asked myself, and maybe you can help answer, and a couple of thoughts of how it relates to my own work. So. I thought I'll, I'll share those. Um, so my first question would be if this um, X tilde, um, we could see that basically as a sort of a prediction of Y, which is not yet calibrated. So basically 
uh, the best mapping of relevant information from X to Y would be the prediction that you can make of Y from X. Um, but the fact that there is this mutual information between this X tilde and X Y is not sufficient to have a good prediction of Y. It just means that you have extracted the information, but you haven't mapped it yet to, to values of Y. So that was my first thought that maybe you can see X, X tilde as a sort of um, extracting all the ingredients for the prediction of Y, but not documenting how you get Y from it yet. Um, so in terms of complexity, what I think is that that something is missing. So if you talk about compressing it in the form of X, that's not sufficient to recreate Y because you need that mapping too. And that in itself has a complexity. Uh, so you need this joint distribution of Y and X tilde to be able to, to actually generate your predictions. Um, yeah, so, so that's, uh, I, I think, where there's a slight difference between the complexity stuff I talk about uh, and this approach. And I think the reason for that is that they assume that the di all the distributions are known, right? And that, that's where the tricky part comes in, because that basically means that you have an infinite amount of data and that defines your distributions. But as soon as you're dealing with limited sample sizes, then for your compression, it still matters how you describe these mappings, because that's a, a number of bits that you need to communicate that mapping. And that will be significant compared to the number of bits you need to describe each single observation as long as your number of observations is small. But when you go to larger data sets, then that number of bits for each observation keeps growing, but the mapping stays constant. So then it becomes more and more negligible. So that was one other thought I had. So I think basically what we're looking at here with this trade off between compression and distortion, um, it, it's very much related to like how, how so, so the compression is actually related to efficiency and how much you bandwidth you need to send the messages. But in order to do that, you, you still need to have the, the encoder and decoder already in place. So if you're just sending a few of those messages, you first need to send the program to encode and decode to your receiver. And that's a significant portion of the bits you need to communicate about why. Um, so I think like they mentioned it very briefly that the estimation of this joint distribution is another question that needs to be addressed and they refer to a paper but i think that was also the one that was never published or in the in the initial it's reference one uh, and it shows as um, in preparation um let's see what else that I have in terms of thoughts. Oh yeah, let me just see if I can share this. Just to be just to be clear, uh, Stephen, you were saying that the representation does not account for the number of bits required to do the encoding and the decoding. That's that was the point you were making just now. Yeah, so basically to describe first of all the the joint distribution, which uh, like they talk only about discrete probabilities, right? So I, I see all those things, all, all those joint distributions that you would need to communicate in order to actually get that transfer going. Yeah. It's a matrix. Um, and, and you need to communicate those, those probabilities in order to, to do the mapping. Got it. Um, so in the end, what you what the receiver would need is the conditional distribution of Y given every single value of X tilde. Um, yeah, so if that's very complex, uh, 
then that should be accounted for. Let me share this window here. You see my uh, screen? Oh, I think I have the wrong one. Sorry. Um, this is the uh, what do you see now? Do you see a, a couple of bars? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I saw something else than you saw. So. Yeah, so, so I, I had this paper uh, about how to score probabilistic forecasts. So let's say uh, you're uh, predicting 90% chance of rain tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes and you observe rain, then you did a pretty good job, right? So how to score the quality of those percentage forecasts or those probability forecasts, and it turns out that there's one um one scoring rule that emerges if you put in some requirements on uh being that uh, what you for the quality of your forecast should only depend on the probability to you attach to the thing you actually observe so that's called locality um and the other one is a proper uh, a proper scoring rule which means that you can only maximize it by communicating your best internal probabilities. Um, so I was wondering um, that if this if the skill score comes out of those requirements that seem very logical, uh, that's probably related to the fact that uh, that the natural distortion measure is also this Gilbert Leibler divergence. Um, and so basically here we have the skill score as a whole, which is, so these are the observed instances uh, of rainfall, yes or no, binary number zero or one. And these are the forecasted probabilities of rain. So the score is actually just a Kobach leibler divergence summed over the different days. But you can decompose that into three terms. Uh, so one, the the bottom one here is the initial uh, uncertainty, which is this bar is basically defined by how uncertain it is in the first place whether it will rain tomorrow. So that depends on the climate. If it's 50-50, then that's maximum. But if you're living in the desert, then there's less uncertainty. Uh, then this resolution is basically related to the mutual information between your predictors and your uh, the one you want to predict. So I think that's very much related to how much information you can get in, into this X1, uh, sorry, in this X tilde. But then there's another thing, which is reliability, which is maybe you have a unique way to map your information to this X tilde. But then if you don't map your X tilde to a, a, the right conditional probability for Y, then you lose some information here. So let's say each time the weather forecaster says there's 70% chance of rain, there's a very high mutual information with that there's actually an 80% chance of rain on all those days, if you look at that over the long term. But the fact that he says 70 and it turns out to be 80 is some miscalibration. And that's what you need to get rid of by reducing this reliability term. So I think that's that's related to that last mapping that's not included in the, in the measure of compression here, basically defining this joint district. So, so in your hydrological model, uh, I'm not sure, or maybe, did you have the slides already in the earlier version you sent me? Oh, yeah. So I, I guess in your hydrological model, is it's basically the function that maps the states to the output. 
in some way and ideally probabilistically. So that was my other thought. And actually what I observed for this decomposition is that you can actually arbitrarily fake resolution. So pretend you have a lot of information in the uh, in the predictors um, by just issuing very detailed forecasts. Uh, but then you pay for that in the reliability term. Yeah, so th this is maybe too too complex a figure to, to explain now, but I found out that the total score is kind of stable, but if you go to finer and finer bins of different forecasts, if you will, uh, these two decomposition terms run away. So it seems that you have more and more resolution, but you also have less and less reliability, which uh, it's a bit confusing that a high reliability is actually unreliability in this weather forecasters terminology, but, but you get this compensation. So I think that might be related to the, to the distortion as well, but I haven't wrapped my round, head around it completely. And then um, the last point I wanted to talk about, um, so I think I discussed this, is another thing um, when you're calibrating models um, for some specific purpose. So let's say you have a, a hydrological model that should sh serve the purpose of flood forecasting and warning. Uh, you might be tempted to think that if you have a discrete decision problem attached to it, um, so for example, you have to evacuate or not. Um, so that ties into the relevance here. So in the information bottleneck paper, they talk about reference as uh, relevance as being information should be about something. So they, they define re relevance as the thing that the information is about. Uh, but in reality, often we might think as re of relevance as not only it should be about the variable I'm interested in, but also it should improve my decisions that I take based on that variable. So let's say we have this evacuation decision to make. So that basically maps this uh, predicted flood here um, to a binary signal, basically, is it too high and should I evacuate or is it below the, the threshold? So that basically in my decision, I only get a, a limited uh, filter of the information so that you could see that as uh, the relevance. Um, so, so then the question could be, well, if I'm making a model for flood forecasting with this purpose, should I not just maximize my utility function based on this cost I have of um, evacuating needlessly and the loss I would have if I not evacuate? Um, and I would argue no, because in the case, if you, if you have observation of, of the flow available, and you calibrate your model based on that, that's basically feeding into your model during calibration and your model extracts information from that. But if you filter that through your utility function, then basically you, you reduce what the model can learn only to basically one bit per, um, uh, per observation. Um, and logically, what my argument would be is that even if you're just interested in floods, uh, the whole flow series, including low flows, can help your model learn to capture the processes better because there is information in there and that might help you with, uh, with predicting the extreme flows as well. But that comes back again to whether you have unlimited data or limited data. If you have unlimited data, then you don't have to be careful with filtering because there's enough information coming through. But if, if you have a limited sample, then uh, I think 
training a model based on the utility of the the decision problem you're aiming at at is not a good idea so so that kind of relates to using this arbitrary distortion me measure versus using information as a distortion measure um yeah so those are all my th thoughts sorry i kept going with all of them at once without giving you a chance to respond so now I'll shut up for a while and uh, let me hear what you think about it i'll stop my share so One quick thought about your very first statement, if X tilde is already a model of Y, I think then you could argue that X is also already a model of Y, which I don't think is the case, unless you'd say all the predictors you use are somehow uh, a, a model of what you want to predict. Yeah, so it's, I would see it as a kind of a proto forecast. So, uh, it's definitely missing this essential part of the final mapping of what the actual value of y is, but you've already extracted all, you've determined what the relevant predictors are um, and distilled it to that. But still, yeah, so I agree with you that it's not a model of y because you need that, that mapping of uh, conditional distribution of y given x tilde as an essential part of your model. Like it would be a, a weather forecaster that's predictably wrong 100% of the time. In principle, all the information is in there, but in order to use it, you have to flip the forecast. Actually, I, I, I interpreted what you were saying, Stephen, as being you're going from x to x tilde to y to d, which is your decision variable. And yeah. it's quite possible that y may not contain all of the information that x has about d. So you might, by going through and the intermediate variable y, you might actually actually lose information that helps you uh, uh, do a better job in your decision variable d because, because y is lossy compared to d. In other words, it doesn't contain all of the information that um, about D that that X actually contains. Yeah, that, that that's actually also an issue. Um, so, so whether you choose your the one the variable that you predict, whether that's complete for containing everything about your decision. But I meant it in the other way around. That if you focus on all the information your x has about d by going through this whole step of making a prediction and then making the decision if you use that final d in your calibration as a measure of how do i extract the maximum value for my decisions um, you're forgetting that you have these observations of y which in the in the limit case of uh, having infinite amount of data uh, whatever is in relevant for d in y will filter through uh, but if you have limited data then actually you have to kind of justify your model complexity um, and if you're using the filtered observations that like only the part relevant for your decisions um, your model complexity tends to be too high more easily than if you use the raw y because maybe your model still learns something from the low flows about the high flows um yeah that, so so i guess there must be a relation between these two problems uh, but so it feels like different pieces of the puzzle are are starting to appear but they don't fully click yet but uh, i think with this group we we might uh, we might make them click by discussing more i have a question if i can follow up the 
when you when you mentioned the so the difference between the information um, mapping part in a sense and the and the distribution. If so, just from what I've seen right now, is this so? Is this then somehow the first part? Is it a question of model in the sense of model selection? So you learn the mapping, and then you argue that then you have to still do some like optimization to actually get the uh, the joint distributions out. Is that what you mean, Stephen, or is this? Um, yeah. So the mapping to X tilde is, is not telling you how to translate X tilde to Y yet, right? So that's, uh, okay, yeah. and that could be a deterministic function. Normally I would say it's a, it's a joint distribution where actually you should also uh, reflect your uncertainty about Y given X tilde. So ideally your model also complains about any measure of complexity that that measures based on X tilde, because basically for your receiver, uh, so, so let's say you have a code word for every weather forecast and the code words, words actually have a very accurate mapping to the types of weather you have. And you you tell the, the, the people on the TV, Agu Wabala, and then you're sure that that's a very good description of the weather that's going coming tomorrow but if the if the receiver doesn't have the dictionary that translates abu wakawa to mildly cloudy with some showers exactly at 301 pm uh, it's not useful for them so so in order to do that you have to send that whole dictionary to them first which is negligible if you're if you provide them with a lifetime of weather forecasts, but for Models, then the size of the dictionary uh, is actually should be penalized in order mm -hmm. to say whether you've really explained anything. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else come up with any analogies with the IB concept to work that they were doing that might be useful to share? I uh, necessarily to what I'm doing, but this kind of struck an idea in my head it relates to stuff that I know Allison has talked about with like uniqueness and redundance. And um, it kind of feels like this information bottleneck is like a way to get at the, I mean, only a unique case, but it's all like getting all the information out of your predictable variable. And I wonder if we could get that, um, get that information and see what that looks like in like sort of physical space rather than a probability space. Like if you could sample from your, um, your bottlenecked distribution to get back, you know, for instance, some presentation time space that's like, this was the relevant presentation hmm. for, this flood or thing like that. I don't know. When when people do random forest type of machine learning, I get the impression that you end up doing something like that. Um, and I think people have been doing that with deep learning where they do some kind of a backward propagation of derivatives to say, is that what you were saying, Andrew? There were certain variables turn out to be the important predictors so, so many time steps back in this particular variable explains most of the variance kind of thing. 
Um, yeah, sort of similar. I'm not, it's not a fully formed thought, so I don't quite know. Yeah, I feel like I had a similar, not very fully formed thought about unique or just types of information and how if you use this method to say, you know, extract relevant information, you could kind of, you know, that, that's maybe a, a way to sort of extract that unique information um, and maybe even synergistic information, say, there's maybe like a, I think Praveen mentioned something in the comments about like a multivariate sort of context where, you know, say you have multiple variables and um, maybe this would be a way to somehow, you know, actually get these distributions that have that information type that you're looking for, for some reason. Yeah. So along with the, the question that Praveen asked, if you have multiple targets, why that you're interested in, then would be interesting to see how many are there and um, how different do they need to be until the best representation or the best compression of x to x tilde is simply x because you would always lose something about one of the targets and i mean you can always compress in a lossless way x to some smaller representation and that would maybe then be the best um, x tilde Best actually in the sense that you're not losing all potential information you might have about anything. Yeah, you never know what the next Y is going to be. Hmm. Yeah, when I was reading the paper, I, I was actually not sure whether X was a, a multivariate vector or a univariate uh, variable. Um, I, think, so, I don't so, think there's anything in the theory that says it has to be univariate. I, I think it can be multivariate. Yeah, so maybe it's about like binning this multi-dimensional space and then quantizing is basically making blocks in those in that multi-dimensional space which yeah. so it's not only just making blocks out of a, a variable but it can be any shaped blocks as long as they kind of span the space together. And in fact, calculating mutual information or even entropy in multidimensional space is a hazardous task at best mm. because you're very poorly sampled usually the space. And yeah. just by changing the, uh, the bidding size, you can dramatically change your um, estimates from uh, one number to a very, I mean, the largest number would be the number of bins, right? So just by putting one data point by per bin, you can have the entropy be equal to uh, the, the log of the number of bins that you have. Yeah. And by reducing it to a single bin, you can, you know, so you can actually go the whole range. And so unless you have a well-defined way of establishing accuracy, you have a serious problem. And, the, and they <laughs> bypass that by just saying that they assume the joint distribution is known. And then you don't need to think about complexity penalization anymore. I think that's, uh, and they refer to this paper in uh, uh, in preparation, right? So I can imagine why that never, <laughs> why they never finalized that. So, so Hoshin, that's uh, this is the um, the aspect of the the. I lost you for. Oh, sorry. Is, is this this uh, this criticism that you mentioned from the twenty twenty paper? Yes, the geometric aspect because we, from the information geometry point of view, because we we are forced to have some estimate of the uh, of the high dimensional space, and this will by definition be it. It wasn't a criticism so much as the whole paper was for was was based on pointing out that uh, there's this aspect called geometric compression that occurs when you're uh, or distortion that occurs when you're calculating your metrics. And so they took that into account. It was a review paper. They were reviewing the literature. Ah, okay. And they were pointing out that some of these problems are difficult to resolve because of problems with establishing the metrics. And then they were trying to read through the fact that different people use different approaches to try to infer something useful. They were saying that this was creating a lot of noise in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, back in back when we met in, um, in uh, uh, on the top of the mountain, 
I had been suggesting that you know we sh if if we as a community wanted to make a lot of progress in a particular area, we might want to choose something like you know we're going to normalize our data this way and use a fixed number of bins, and then that determines the minimum data length we could use, and so on and so forth. It it still doesn't result in necessarily accurate estimates of entropy. We need to work on that. But it might give you comp numbers that you can compare across studies yeah. that different people do. And personally, I'm trying to work on a method uh, for 1D entropy estimation, which is not based on binning, because I think there's some serious problems with binning. I mean, what do you think about the effect of binning? And you know, I, I think of like the information measure issue that you brought up as a PDF estimation issue, and yes. Yeah, you know, the binning makes a big difference in the method that you use. It's hard to compare across cases, but even things like data, um, like a data pre-processing and things like that, you know, like how do you remove outliers? You know, like what, what, what level of outlier do you remove for what type of data? And like, what is the optimal number of bins for a given type of data? Because that's going to vary depending on whether you're looking at precipitation or stream flow. I mean, it's just like, yeah. it, it's a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, to sort of say, you know, this is the way that we're going to make a PDF and it might not be the right way, but we're all going to do it the same way. And, you know, that's really attractive. Um, but exactly. I guess, I guess I don't know, like there, there's so many other, there's so much other baggage that comes along with that, that I kind of wonder about it. Well, well, I'm trying, I'm trying to identify the series of steps and the problems associated with each step. For example, even once you do a bin, uh, the the uncertainty in the probability estimate associated with the bin uh, is governed by a binomial distribution, uh, which has to do with the sample size, and it has to do with the size of the probability. You know, so each bin, you say, um, if fifty percent of the data points fall in the bin, then you've got a probability of 0.5 associated with that bin. But the uncertainty associated with that is very different from another bin in which you have only three data points fall in the bin because only three data points were involved in the, in the estimation of P. And um, so the probabilities are very low. The distributions of the, uns of the sampling variability are highly skewed. And so, so when you estimate using binning, you've got varying levels of confidence in the probability estimates in each bin, okay? because you're using fixed size binning. So you get some you get some serious problems uh, uh, with using binning, even if you use something like optimal, because there's no such thing as an optimal bit fixed with bin, which works across the entire distribution. So that takes you to what we can take forty two bins always. There we go. Uh, we're done. We go to quantum level, and then that's fine. <laughs> Maybe I so, see. So it makes sense that you have to use variable with with binning. And personally, I prefer an approach based on quantile estimation, where you estimate the quantiles of the distribution and then use some kind of interpolation scheme. So we're, we're working on trying to uh, show how that would work and compare it to binning to see if we can get more accurate estimates with smaller sample sizes and more reliable oh. estimates. I guess to bring that back to rate distortion theory, um, like what Mojigan has been doing lately is actually quantizing data based on rate distortion theory, which I kind of see as another way of making a PDF with variable bin sizes, right? Yeah. So, but then it's like, you know, like they say in the paper, it's kind of arbitrary what you decide is your distortion measure and what is the best way to, to do that maybe it's something else. Yeah, what we've been trying to do is take uh, a bunch of classical uh, dis distributions and some non-classical ones, um, which have properties that we might encounter normally, and ask questions like, uh, how many quantiles do you need? What's the minimum sample size you need in order to get within a certain percent estimate of the theoretical true entropy that you know? So that you might be able to at least get some empirical ideas as to what the limitations are. You can't do it for distributions you don't know, but you can do it for distributions for which you can calculate reasonably accurately the, ac the, the true the true entropy. Okay. Um, yeah. 
and that's 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 just one dimensional entropy. You know, how do you do mutual information? Well, mutual information is still one D entropy, but how do you start doing that in higher dimensional spaces? Is jury's out. Anybody else? You... Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted, Edison. Uh, can... It just cut out can for me. Just... Sorry, the rate rate distortion aspect. So now we have a communication issue here. It's better. <laughs> rate distortion. This aspect you mentioned about rate distortion. Can you explain it just in a couple of words? What is the idea? Mojgen, go. <laughs> Sorry, the, this aspect about rate so, distortion, Maria? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so our, our thought was about, um, okay, okay. so Mojgen took information theory as a course, and this was totally not my idea. I had no idea what rate distortion theory was. Um, but for her class project, she did um, using rate distortion theory to look at model complexity um, or model forcing precision. Um, so you can give a little spiel on that, Mojgen. I'm muted. Right oh, we can't hear you. Oh. She's not muted. I don't know. No, it's not here. Maybe the. Okay, the never mind. <laughs> Can you take out your headphones and speak? No. Still not. We cannot hear you. I'll just say real briefly, and, and maybe she'll maybe she'll pop in here. Um, yeah. But but basically, our, our thought was kind of like how to to what extent can we simplify forcing data of a model and run the model, and what is the influence of that on the model output? Um, and our our colleague's idea. Um, so her professor's thought was like, well, maybe a quantized version of your input data could actually improve your model results um and i was kind of like no you know like i was like no, no way um and so so we kind of have not got really conclusive results on that but but there are cases where that happens where it turns out that a simpler version of our input data leads to a more accurate representation from our model um relative to you know our, our observational data um, but not not always, and it depends on you know like what variable you're quantizing and how you're quantizing it, or whether you're quantizing multiple variables. Um, so she has some interesting findings, and the way that she's quantizing those that forcing distribution is is using rate distortion theory, where she is finding kind of iteratively threshold values and um, simplifying the input data based on these like threshold values. Um, that minimize a distortion measure. Oh, thanks. So, so this was really like relevant to that because now we're thinking like, well, actually you could quantize differently to actually specifically preserve information about your output variable, right? So it's just kind of a different way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Right, when thanks. you say quantizing, does it mean taking away digits from the numbers? Or does it mean taking away different types of predictors? It means changing the precision. I, I think of it as changing the precision of your input data. Um, but strategically, so, so not just taking away decimal points, but um, is to say, say if, you, if you wanted to really intensely quantize your data, you might say, well, I have temperature and I have a temperature instrument that measures temperature to within 0.2 degrees, but I just want hot or cold. Um, and how do you define hot and cold? And, and that would be a two bin quantization where you have some temperature that you define this is hot and some temperature that you define this is cold. Um, and then your, all, all your data gets redefined as those two values. Um, Alison, could I interpret sort of... could I interpret that as when you quantize you quantize to slightly larger than possibly the noise in the data, and so somehow you preserve in relevant information because you're throwing away noise. 
Yeah, I, I think that's maybe what what we see also. Um, th there is an issue though, like our output observational data is also noisy. Like it, you know, it, it's like our our so, so now we are wondering about our observational data, and it's like, well, should we be comparing? quantized model output with a quantized version of our output data also. Um, so there, there's that question too. I mean, the interesting point is that your data is already quantized, right? Because it's already at a certain numerical precision. So you're dealing with quantization error and noise at the same time. Yeah. This sounds similar like what random forests do when you create a split. So you are defining different Hmm. So in some ways, it's the same idea. So maybe by the quantizing, by reducing the number of different values that you have, you increase the population of the remaining bins, which means you get better estimates of your relations, of your probability, of your joint probability distributions which may be uh, an explanation why things improve despite making cost graining the input. There's a, there's a relevant concept in the information bottleneck paper, which is that the reason that they claim that after you reach the top of the curve, you start to compress the X tilde is because they say you reach a stage where you're now just doing a random walk in the parameter space. In, in other words, your parameter space now can, your, param, your, your quantization now is adding noise. And uh, this relates to something I remember reading about a long time ago that when, um, when what people discovered was that by adding small amounts of noise to sound, uh, data, sound files, they could actually improve the crispness with which the music was registered in the brain. This is the Dolby effect. And uh, so something about adding noise is relevant to, in Random Forest, Luis may talk about this, adding noise actually helps to not fit the, the, the specific data, but to generalize better. And so you learn the patterns as opposed to learning specifically the noise in your particular data set, Some, something like that. It just sparked that thought. Uh, another thing that may be related to this is um, like dimensionality reduction might be maybe seen as roughly the same thing because whether you're quantizing by making bigger blocks in one dimension versus if you have a, let's say a 3D matrix filled with blocks and you're compressing it down to, to a two dimensional space, the bottom line is you end up with, with less blocks that you have to represent with higher probability each. So I think maybe dimensionality reduction and quantization in the discrete space are kind of similar in a way. That's something maybe, uh, Stephen, with this discussion last last year, I think um, these especially mutual information estimates, which are which are which have some kernel based methods, because then you basically do some sort of a dimensionality reduction at the same time you're estimating the density distribution from kernels instead of a fixed binning. Yeah. But then, of course, you also have to decide the number of kernels you're using. And of course, the more kernels, you get a different estimate again. Yeah. I guess that's a result that uh, turns up often in information theory that whatever way you approach it, some problems just won't go away. Still no free lunch. <laughs> 42, 42 then is good. <laughs> I think I'll agree. Uh, <laughs> right here, right now. That's <laughs> uh, <certainly. laughs> Who was the author? We can call it, we can name the effect after him. Um, Douglas Adams. The, oh, the Adams effect. Okay, thank you.
that was my contribution to the discussion. <laughs> Any other comments by anybody? Thoughts? So I guess it was interesting enough that we went 25 minutes over our normal scheduled time. That's right. Yeah. So thanks, Leila. What's the next plan? Um, the next one, it's going to be the debates paper, Algorithmic IT. So it's the paper by Ben Rodol and Stephen Weiss. And we still don't have volunteers for, for that paper, for the discussion. So I am recruiting volunteers now. <laughs> I have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> we might have time and the interest to review that paper at the next meeting three weeks from now. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely not going to present it because uh, I got confused reading my own paper. <laughs> <laughs> what what date is this? The uh, 11th? Is this November 11th? Um, I'm going to turn my screen very quickly. Um, and I can show you. So it's uh, November 11, the next one. I've read this. I can I can do this one, I think, if no one else is Perfect. volunteering. It's nice to have a second to also comment if somebody else would volunteer. I can volunteer together with Alison if she likes. Perfect. Sounds good. I know that the students are not speaking up, although we did have uh, 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 Mash and and I um, can't remember who, uh, jo Jonathan do one. So uh, Leila, you need to lean more on students here. Absolutely. OK, next time, more students, at least one in every session. And as motivation, I'll just point out that it's incredibly valuable to do this. I mean, just you just learn so much by by forcing yourself to try to get your head around the concepts in, in something. So even though it takes time out of your life, it's just really valuable. Absolutely. Thank you, actually, Hoshin, for the great explanation and also to Stephen for the great discussion on the paper because I think also the illustrations in the slide. Uh, were very beneficial to me to, to really understand the, the concepts in the paper. So I think you did an excellent compression of the relevant information in the paper. <laughs> so that was awesome. And I think we all got a better idea of what um, is really the content of the, of the paper and also an understanding of the controversy in the scientific community around the paper. So. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, if you could send me those two slides that you added. Yeah. I'll put them into the master. And then, Leila, if you would send me the link where I can deposit the PowerPoint, I'll go ahead and deposit it. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. All right, guys, see you in three weeks. Thanks a lot for in oh, And we, we need more future. suggestions for papers, too, so future papers. Yeah. Bye, yes. Hoshin. Good presentation. Bye. Right, thank you. Care. Thank Bye, you. Steve. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Wir müssen schnell die Kinder ins Bett bringen, Florian. Wir sind schon längst im Bett, deswegen gehen wir hier. Was sieht das eigentlich wie Schnee bei einer Haus? Remember that, Hoshin? I'm experiencing extreme rate distortion when you guys talk to each other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So you stole that glass from the Schneeferner house? No, I, I won it at the kicker tournament, please. Oh, oh. Ah. Well, it's I too remember bad. that. I didn't know they had them. I would have kept a souvenir, right? Painful <laughs> memories. It's, it's so hard. You know, usually I, a lot of beer glasses or other glasses, of course, get destroyed at some stage in the dishwasher or kids throwing them down. But these ugly ones, they just... <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice. It's very nice. I'm going to propose that we have to go. We have to go back to the Schneefer House uh, when this is all over, and we can come back to Europe again. 
because I have fond memories of that. Oh, yes. That was... Yeah, I'd be happy to organize it again. Cool. Yeah. Oh, Shane, I need to leave, but I make you the host if you want to stay and hang out for a little bit more. So. Actually, I need to go to you, so. Okay. Uh, bye. And I had now more, almost 12 hours of Zoom today. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Thank you for including me here. It's really nice. I, I enjoy the discussions a lot. Thanks. Florian, let me know when you want to talk about the uh, site information thing. I think that would be interesting. Yes, I really, I have to catch up a bit now with all, all the team Hi. teaching, but uh, this paper looks so interesting. Yeah, no problem. I was distorted again now. <laughs>